Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. On Tuesday night here in Phoenix, a white Phoenix police officer shot and killed an unarmed black suspect, a man, a suspect in a drug deal. The officer was not harmed, but the 34 year old man, Remain Brisbane, was killed in a scuffle with the officer at a North Phoenix apartment complex. In what's become a storyline that we have seen repeated across this country, not only in Ferguson, Missouri, but in New York City and elsewhere, there is a concern in the African American community about policing. I wanted to share with you this interview with the Reverend Jarrett Maupin about this whole situation. Now, whether you agree with Reverend Maupin or not, this is worth a listen just to get some insight into how these violent episodes with police are viewed by some in our community. And again, this interview was conducted on Tuesday night with Reverend Maupin just hours after the shooting. Tell me what you know at this hour. What I know, um, Ann Hart and I were, were briefed by uh, uh, Sergeant Smith with Phoenix PD. He's our liaison for the African American Advisory Committee. What I know is that there's a 30-year-old black man uh, who was shot and killed by a Phoenix police officer after uh, an alleged drug deal. Now, now community members on the on the scene um, told us when we when we were just up there um, that um, the gentleman fled the scene after a scuffle. But it was clear to them that he was unarmed uh, and a appeared to be running for his life um, uh, and and was cornered. And, and shot by uh, shot by the shot by the officer. What do you expect will happen uh, as as everybody gets wind of this and, and people start to obviously in light of Ferguson? What well, do you expect will happen in Phoenix? I hope transparency will happen from on the part of the police department. There were three suspects. I'm told two black, one white. The cop chose to pursue the black suspect. Um, chased down the black suspect. Shot the blast the black suspect. Um, that deserves an explanation. The community is very angry. Um, uh, when this happened, my phone it exploded. It got up from the dinner table. Um, there's clearly a crisis in the community. Um, this is right on the tail of what happened in, in Ferguson, a very questionable shooting. Um, people are angry. People are very angry. I don't want to get too deep into Ferguson, but um, you know, I know in the African-American community, there's real distrust of the whole process of what happened there. But the evidence is the evidence. And what we did learn is often what we hear early on is not right. Are you throwing up some cautionary flags tonight to say, let's be careful here? Tonight, uh, caution is, is thrown to the wind. Um, this is Phoenix, and it's worse than Ferguson in many ways. Uh, we had the shooting of Michelle Cousseau by Percy Dupre. Um, just uh, uh, last year, we wrapped up the situation with Richard Chrisman and the killing of, of Daniel Rodriguez. Uh, now we have this person that's been killed by a member of the Phoenix PD. Uh, there's too much killing uh, with this department. Um, there, there, there's just too much violence and too much angst between Phoenix PD and members of our community. Let me read you something, because this, this caught my eye. This was from the uh, Center for Juvenile Crime, uh, Juvenile and Criminal Justice. And the title of the article, they did research on this, who are police killing? And it showed that the rate of police killings, as we've called this an epidemic, they've actually gotten much, it's not perfect, but it's gone way down since the 60s. I and mean, we were looking at over 100 a year. Now we're well below that. Do you believe that we have the kinds of racial problems here with the police that you would have in Ferguson or Detroit or Chicago? Would you put us in that category? Oh, w without question. If you look at the deaths we you experienced, would. I would. In the 90s and, the, and now in the 2000s, um, just the last year with the, with the shooting death of Michelle Cousseau, the mentally ill woman that had the hammer in her hand, um, Daniel Rodriguez, young Latino, kid, I preached his funeral, um, people are, are, are dying. They're being killed uh, by Phoenix PD, and, and it should cause uh, concern in our community. The overall national trend may be a reduction in police-related deaths, but here in Phoenix, uh, we're experiencing police violence like, like never before. What do you think is the reason? I think it's poor training. I think there is, there is fear uh, on the side of the community and fear on the side of the police. Um, John, if I can speak frankly with you, Please. I think there's fear between 
between black and, and white, uh, between Fear. people in, a, in, in authority and people out of authority. Yes, absolutely. Okay, tell me, Reverend Maupin, tell me what happens in the mind of a black man, a young black man, when a cop pulls up. I could be killed. Um, I didn't do anything wrong. Why me? Uh, what are they going to do? Um, we had a young man the other day at an NAACP rally that talked about being profiled on the bus. Um, he looked like the person they thought stole something out of a Safeway grocery store, but, but he was on his way home from school. The cops stopped him, roughed him up, you know, demanded his ID. He was petrified. What I hear you saying is that a white guy like me cannot relate to this. Well, I think, I think the white community can relate to it, civilians, but, but whites within the police department, because of the training that they're receiving, um, because of the, the mindset they're given on how to deal with the community, I don't think they can relate. I mean, the, our police manuals tell our cops that you can't look black people in the eye because it makes us uncomfortable. That's absurd. That's absurd. What happens when this all hits, that this guy was unarmed? When the community finds out that, that this man was unarmed, um, I don't think I can keep the lid on Phoenix. We saw that with Michelle Cousseau. Even with the Ferguson protests, the Attorney General and I made the appeal for peace. Um, this is uh, something far worse than Cousseau. This man was unarmed. He was fleeing and cornered when he was shot. Is this Edward Mallett of 20 years ago or worse? This is worse than, than, than Edward Mallett because Edward Mallett was, was just you know, physical brutality. This is, a, this is a police officer gunning down an unarmed man who was fleeing. But again, we don't know the circumstances. What if he felt threatened? Well, what if the officer felt threatened? Police have told us he felt threatened. Uh, look, they had a scuffle at the car. The first thing that the cops have said is, is well, we found a gun and marijuana in the Escalade. Um, that's not where you shot him. You, you shot him um, a ways away from the vehicle. Um, he was fleeing. We have special units in the Phoenix Police Department that deal with, with standoffs, that deal with people who are locked in buildings, um, the people who may be armed and dangerous. Why did, the, why did the officer pursue him in that way? If he felt threatened, he should have waited for backup. How do you respond when, when you know, when you go on the air tomorrow, when this airs, you're going to have people in the community, predominantly white people, say, that mopping, he's just like Sharpton and the rest coming on television and getting everybody agitated. How do you respond to that when people say you're an agitator, you're not solving it, you're making it worse? They don't have their dinners interrupted by people of color who are afraid for their lives, and I do. I left my dinner table to address this issue. Um, my life stops when these things happen because people need help, they're, they're scared. They're scared. They're scared for their lives of the police. Man, that is a that is an awful charge. I mean that. Well, it's it's true. It's true. And every time one of these instances happen, we talk about healing. We talk about having community conversations about race. We talk about augmenting training. We talk about how to fix it. We never get the work done. If this didn't happen on the heels of Ferguson. Are we even having this conversation tonight? Yes, we are. Um, it happened on the heels of the shooting death of, of Michelle Cousseau. It's happened on, on the heels of the death of uh, uh, Tamir Greeson in, in, in Cleveland, the 12-year-old who was shot with a toy gun. Uh, it happened on, on the tail end of, 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 of Eric Garner with that verdict coming down. There is a rash of police killings around the country and police killings that have happened in this city. I told people. Don't get outraged about Ferguson. If you're going to get outraged, get outraged about the killings that are happening in this city. And they are happening in this city. And you expect it to blow up? I expect it to blow up. I expect I'll be preaching this funeral, too. Uh, and so for anyone that questions it, I invite them to come along. See the mourning of the community. That, that pain is, is real. And I don't want to see more people die. I don't want to see cops die. I don't want to see black people die. But black lives matter, but not not in Phoenix, not right now, not with PD. And that, that is, that is, 
It's unacceptable. Has Phoenix PD done enough to get into the black community in the last few years to try to head some of this off? I'm talking about um, community, people within PD, upper brass with PD, have they done enough? I don't think so because behind every crisis they send out the community response unit and the answer is we're going to build on this relationship, uh, we value the relationship, what more can we do? Clearly there's a problem. You know, if the police department reacts to this in the same way that they have these other killings we've experienced, they haven't learned from it. They haven't learned from it. I, I, that's been my plea tonight when I talk to clergy, other African-American leaders. Which killing of a black person by police is going to be their teachable moment? Which, which one are they going to learn from? Um, and what have they learned from the time of, of, of Rick Rankins or Ed Mallett to today? What have they learned? You know that there are a bunch of white guys who get killed out there at the hands of That's police. Right. They charge police, they brandish a weapon, they threaten to kill themselves, they start flashing a weapon around, some of it's suicide by cop. There are plenty of white guys shot and killed by police. That's right. I stood with a white family uh, about uh, seven months ago, uh, 15th Avenue in Glendale. Their, their son uh, opened the door. He had a table leg in his hand, mentally ill. You probably remember that case. He didn't need to die either. Okay, so you're saying it's not just a black issue. You're saying it's an excessive force issue. I'm saying it's, Across it's, the an, board. it's an abuse of force issue. Uh, it's, a, it's a quick to kill issue across the board. And, and, and it's, it's killing people of every race, but it, it is impacting African Americans the most because, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we seem to, in the inner city, uh, feel the brunt of, of, these, of these random stops. Look, the officer said somebody told him a drug deal was going down. What kind of policing is that? Somebody tells you there's a drug deal going, do you know if, that, if, if all it takes is for you to tell a white person or a private citizen to tell a cop that a drug deal is going down, who's to say they won't run up to, to my Escalade? This was a white cop, right? That's right. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, I, Floor is yours. You know, I, I make an appeal to the community to react in a responsible and a, and a nonviolent way. I, I do think civil disobedience is in order when, when issues like this happen. Um, we need to know this man's name. Uh, we need to know the name of the officer. Was this officer on the Brady list? These are the standard questions that we have for Phoenix PD. They already know what we want to know. They need to step up and but, tell us. But you're not calling for civil disobedience right now, are you? Uh, I'm it's meeting, a little early for that. I'm right? meeting with the family uh, uh, first thing tomorrow morning. And you don't I, want to see this place up in flames. This, we all live here. We all got to get along here. I, I don't want to see Phoenix literally on fire, but I think figuratively, a lot of blacks wouldn't mind seeing it. And that's what civil disobedience is. Uh, demanding equal protection under the law, equal treatment from the police. And if we have to set the city ablaze um, with our unbridled tongues, with our, with our marching feet, that's what we must do. What if somebody says, let's just play devil's advocate for a minute here. Somebody says to you, Reverend, um, not one life is improved or made better economically, socially, by, for instance, throwing this cop in jail because of this. That it doesn't help anybody's life to just kind of pound of flesh, pound of flesh, and keep going down that road. Do you know what I mean? Well, What's lives have equal value. If we find that the officer used excessive force and, and killed this black man, is the life of the black man not equal to the life of the white police officer? Um, and the sad part about that, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, because the sad part about that is in the eyes of a lot of people, they, their lives aren't equal, and they don't have equal value. Uh, and that's, that's the, the tragedy of, of race and race relations in our country. That has to do more with economic opportunity that's denied or policing problems, or both? Economic opportunities, but policing problems, the profiling, the way we treat each other, the way we talk to each other. Um, they shouldn't treat people on the street any differently than they would treat me if they pulled, if they pulled me over, and we know there's a difference. Um, they shouldn't treat a, a white person that they pull over in Sunny Slope any different than they do in Scottsdale, but we know there's a difference. We have to address that difference. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.
The Reverend Jared Maupin, a good insight, at least into the mind of some folks in our community who are really, really concerned, genuinely concerned about policing situations. And we will talk more about it in the future on Newsmaker Sunday. But coming up next, we're going to shift gears here during the holiday season. We've got to talk about this homelessness in our community. It is a problem. The Super Bowl's coming here. Eyes of the world are on this place. What are we doing about this issue, and have we made any progress in the last 25 years? Ted Taylor is the executive director of Family Promise of Greater Phoenix. He joins me next on Newsmaker Sunday. And we're back changing gears on Newsmaker Sunday with Ted Taylor, one of the really great guys in this community. He is the executive director of Family Promise of Greater Phoenix. We're going to talk a little bit about homeless. And before you start to click the remote, what would you, what would be, what would you say to folks who are thinking about saying, I don't want to hear this? I guess the first thing I'd say to them is that we have an incredibly good community that cares deeply about the homeless. And at this time of year, I, because I'm the director of Family Promise, get to experience the goodness of people who come into Family Promise and the people at churches who serve our families. They give expecting absolutely nothing in return. That's what I want to say to the community. The, the other thing may be that when we think of homeless, we think of single men, mental issues, drug dependency issues, alcohol, chronic alcoholic, um, all of those things. We, we think of this, that image right there. But you've got tons of families in this situation, and it's awful. Man, thank you so much for saying that, because I think what I want to share with people is that families don't stand on street corners, and families don't beg for money. In fact, most of the time, these families want to remain anonymous. Yet, 40% of the homeless population in Maricopa County is families. And 40%? 40%. But watch this. John, here, this is staggering. 84% of those are single mothers with two to three children below the age of 10. Those are the people that we're serving and the other family shelters are serving. Could we talk about this idea that many people out there are literally one crisis or one missed paycheck away from disaster? Well, exactly right. I think one of the things I try to explain to people is that we're all blessed to not be in this situation because you know what causes this homelessness? Number one is the loss of a job. Number two, they run out of savings. And number three, they run out of friends and family. Then they're homeless. And that's many people. I've had police officers, firefighters. I've had so many wow. people in our program. Cross section of the, of the community. Absolutely right. So we really do have a great number of people who are right on the edge. Oh, totally, absolutely. And is that case. is that something that we see more of in Arizona than maybe other states? Well, I'm sorry to say that you probably saw the report uh, two weeks ago now that we're 45th out of 50 states in the number of children in homelessness. That is a staggering statistic. In Arizona, we have a significant problem with child homelessness. Tell me what you do with Family Promise, and if there's a fix, is this the model to fix it? Oh my gosh, I'm, I so believe in Family Promise. And, and let me explain how, why this works so well. We serve shelter to homeless families through the, faith, through the interfaith community. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we sleep families at churches for seven days in a row at each church. We've been doing this for 14 years. The congregations provide at no cost all the food for our families and overnight shelter on Coleman blow-up mattresses where they provide the sheets, blankets, pillows, and people to sleep overnight with our families. Why is that so important? Do you know what heals a family? It's when the children feel loved. It's the immersion of love at the congregational level where non-denominational, it's just about loving these children. Right. And these children will begin to heal in about one to two weeks from no the kidding. You've seen damage. It. Oh, I right. see it all the time. Tell me about the damage because people who, and, and again, uh, what you're saying is this is really of no cost to the public. This is people donating, the church is donating. This is people giving this from This is not government heart. getting involved. That's correct. This is doing it a different way. Oh, this is all about the 
public coming together to save these families. And by the way, we're saving over 100 families a year this way. But there's not enough of this out there, right? That's there's good. still more demand than there is supply we, to take care of these folks. We could triple in size on any given night. There's, I estimate, 200 to 250 families sleeping out there because there is no space in left in the shelter, in, either in their car or in a park or on the street. There is no shelter left. We are completely full. But I want to touch something, John, you said a minute ago. You ask, what is the damage? Listen to this. A child who is homeless is four times more likely to be sick than a regular child. A child who is homeless is 50% more likely to have mental health issues than a regular child. And the staggering statistic is that one third of homeless children will either be taken away from their parents or given up to foster care. We have to save these children, John. What about um, crime rate from kids who are in this situation? I think the most... If it's not addressed. I think what Family Promise represents is catching families, first-time homeless families who've never been in homelessness, and returning them to employment and their own homes so that we don't create this cycle where the mm -hmm. children live in poverty and live on the dependence of others. No, we are all about getting them back on their feet and employed. Right. Average family within 28 days of em is employed. And if they can start to get employment, they can start to save a little money to get it a, a place. It changes everything. And there are, there are um, efforts out there to get people into, into low-cost housing Absolutely and try to get a, a roof over their head. Um, we're, I don't even want to bring it up. Uh, you know, the, the certainties in life, death and taxes, we're heading into the tax season. There is a tax credit here that is very, very important. People need to know about this, and I want to just give you the floor for a minute to explain. Let me say a couple things. One is, Arizona is the only state in the United States of America to offer a 100% charitable tax credit, which means that if somebody makes a donation to a qualified charity like Family Promise, they will get 100% of that donation back in a tax credit, as well as it is a federal deduction. This is unheard of. I yet, thought we were a laggard in every category. Oh, and yet Arizona is incredible in this area. Yet watch this, only 2%, only 79,000 people gave last year. It's the same as the public school tax credit. The same people qualify. You, you can, can do, do both. both. You can do both. But they don't know about okay, it. Okay, so again, on, when you have your, if you haven't done it, HR Block or whoever you do, yes. tell them you want to use this $100 tax credit because it's, you will get it back 100 for 100. It's actually, it costs you nothing. Yeah, $200 an individual, $400 maximum a family. That's the most you can give. But you have to give it to the charity, and then the charity will give you a receipt that you put with your taxes, and you will get it all back, or you will not have to pay those taxes. It's incredible. Why do people not know about this? You know, I think do the tax preparers not tell them? Or I, I think we owe you a thank you today because it's the awareness. The community doesn't know. If they knew that they could help these families who are homeless, they would these do it. children with a free tax credit, I think they would do it. I know they would do it because yeah. I've seen every time we have a family in need on, on our newscast, um, you guys step up every, every single time. I All right, we'll be back uh, with Ted in a moment. We're gonna talk some more about the problem of homelessness and I raise the question, are we better off? Have we done more and accomplished more in this last 20 years or are we spinning our wheels? We'll talk to Ted about that right after this. Final moments with uh, Ted Taylor. He's the executive director of Family Promise of Greater Phoenix. I asked, are we better off than we were 20 years ago in you know, homelessness? John, I think we're continuing to struggle in this area. I think the community is really struggling with how to deal with the volume of homelessness. And I think it's all about awareness. It's recognizing that it's, it's out there. And we've got a minute left. Is government the answer here? Your whole group, what you guys do, is completely funded separate and apart from government. I absolutely believe, John, that the public-private partnerships like Family Promise that utilize the faith community and the community at large that wants to give and help these families is the answer to how to stop homelessness from continuing. The way we do that is we stop it when it starts, when they first fall into homelessness. We don't wait to, to, for that problem to Where get out of control. Where they're a year downstream and they Correct. start to actually adapt to that way of life. Correct. And so I think, uh, I believe deeply that Family Promise is doing something that is profoundly changing the way it's done. We're saving right now 
And this is going on across the country. Family Promise is here, but how many states now? 41 states, 187 affiliates, saving 50,000 people a year. Man, bless you for your work. It's my pleasure. Great to see you, Ted. Thank you Happy so much. Happy holidays. And, uh, Same to you. and remember about the tax credit 100 bucks for 100 bucks. You can't beat that deal. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and get all the best videos from Fox 10.